Chapter 8 The Yoga of Imperishable Brahman. Chapter 8 About this chapter. This is the chapter that speaks about death and the conscious preparation and experience of it as well. It is focused on answering the questions that Arjuna raises about such a time and the experience of what lies beyond death too. From the previous chapter, Arjuna has learned how to discriminate between the lower and higher natures of the eternal self to enjoy the pleasures of life while living as a perfect man of wisdom that is ever liberated from the suffering of finite experiences. He learned about names and forms that are part of the lower nature, also known as prakriti in Sanskrit. This chapter is for inspiring Arjuna to master the world of objects, the organs of perception and action, and the instruments of comprehension that allow man to achieve enduring success from such wisdom. Krishna explains in this chapter how just like the ocean is filled with waves, foam, and ripples, which are all known by us to still be the ocean, the self is the reality upon which all actions, instruments of action, and the world of perception are superimposed, or as they are mistaken for the self. Thus, knowing the higher self, everything else is known too. Krishna explains in this chapter how just like the ocean is filled with waves, foam, and ripples, which are all known by us to still be the ocean, the self is the reality upon which all actions, instruments of action, and the world of perceptions are superimposed, as in mistaken for the higher self. Thus, Knowing the higher self, everything else is known too. This sounds interesting, but unclear to Arjuna, so he begins to now ask the questions which are flooding his mind, questions that any intelligent seeker would be curious to know about and understand. In this chapter, Arjuna has seven key questions to ask Krishna, and as we know, Krishna encourages questions for personal understanding about what he shares rather than through blind following of his words. As Arjuna has learned, wisdom requires both learning and experiencing a truth. Arjuna asks about Brahman, about karma, and also three other important Sanskrit words. Atyatma, ad, Adibhuta, Adideva. These represent the essential being, the essential deity, and the essential sacrifice. Remember that Arjuna has been previously well studied in ancient scripture, so he has learned about these terms but does not fully comprehend them. These are the things that Arjuna has heard man should understand to know him, as even at the time of death, with a steady mind, Arjuna is eager to know the proper explanations of these terms and also to understand how one can realize the higher self at the time of death when from one's right spiritual practices. Arjuna's first question is what exactly is that, which is called the Supreme Brahman or God or pure consciousness? So Krishna's first answer is that the nature of Brahman is imperishable and unchanging. It is the essence behind the world. He also tells Arjuna that it is his own higher self. It is being itself, not a nature of being. Like fire is just hot, it does not have the nature of being hot. This is to clarify that not like the body, mind, intellect, thoughts, feelings, and relationships, which are what a person has rather than what he is. Everything man has is changeable whereas what a person is, is unchanging and eternally stable. The subtle essence is also that which illumines the body, mind, and intellect in every life through every lifetime. It is the energy allowing the functioning of these equipments. Karma is explained as an action that creates something which was not present before. An action produces a creation. Adiyatma is the subtle energy that graces all bodies as the essential self, the higher essential self. 
This subtle spiritual strength gives rise to the creative urge behind every active intellect to fulfill itself in the creation of things and beings through karma. The Adibhuta is the perishable existence and he focuses here on the cognition, feeling and perception of man which is changeable. Adideva is described as the awareness, the indweller, that is the special faculty governing each apparatus of knowledge and activity in living beings, known as Purusha in Sanskrit. This includes the faculty of vision as the eyes, hearing in the ears, smelling in the nose, etc. Krishna is explaining that the one vital factor that dominates the entire higher self is the principle of life through the subjective act of perception, through knowledge of the higher self, and that this knowledge of the eternal self alone is the real, that all else are delusory superimpositions upon it. Knowing the real nature of the eternal self allows one to freely play through any of the fields of the not-self through the perishable tools. Krishna explains the nature of the world as first being experienced by the equipment used to see them. He also explains the collective subtle body. To understand this, each person can be seen to have a subtle body that interprets through its own thoughts, emotions, responses, and feelings. The subtle bodies of everyone combines to create the collective subtle body, which creates the collective experience. In this chapter, Krishna explains the mind and its thoughts at the time of death, remembering that whatever is thought about consistently is what is most prominently remembered. This can be seen from the basic experience of waking in the morning after thinking something the night before. This will be what the mind will be thinking about on waking too. The mind's desire brings the next experience, so whatever the mind thinks of regularly will be the start of the experience of the next day or life. For one who is satisfied and content, the next waking or life experience is not based on the desires held in the mind. So Krishna suggests that Arjuna think about him, higher consciousness, even at the last minute of life to enter union with his graces in the next life. In whichever way a person remembers God or higher consciousness at the end of life will be the form that he experiences this union because that is what the mind is occupied or filled with. Whatever the desire or experience of joy is, what is brought to the person. Even if this is something filled with fear or worry, this will be what is experienced. Of course, with a mind that is filled with guilt or concerns, This will be where the mind wakes or is reborn into. The point that Krishna is trying to make to Arjuna is that he is still to do his work, his dharma, through his karma yoga, which is action, while maintaining connection with him or higher consciousness as a sort of offering or sacrifice. Krishna describes that work as worship is the beginning and heading towards the worship as the work is the direction when each experience is seen as God or higher consciousness working through the human form. So then man becomes the instrument of God's action. Krishna tells Arjuna to have no doubt about this, that the man of doubt experiences no peace in this life or in the life hereafter. The final question Arjuna asks in this chapter is what and how he should think of Krishna or God or higher consciousness, at the time of death. Arjuna is interested in preparing himself for this inevitable time whenever it happens. Now that Arjuna knows that his last thoughts are most important, he understands he should know what specifically to think about. One can consider that in times of crisis, as Arjuna is in right now, It is not easy to think clearly, so unless someone is practicing thinking clearly in all times, this training is not available in the mind in times of crisis, including death. When a person is filled with greed, jealousy, anger, and ego, it is not easy or likely to think from a space of higher consciousness when in the middle of crisis. Yet this is what Krishna is encouraging, even as Arjuna is preparing to fight. 
especially when a person is facing people that he or she does not agree with, this is the most important time to utilize this awareness. Krishna is clear that this is the ideal practice at all times, not only during a religious pilgrimage, during a meditative experience, or in times of personal silence. It is ideal at all times. The only possibility to remember higher consciousness at all times is by knowing that the Supreme Creator has created everything in existence. Arjuna can give all, his thoughts, words, and actions, as a sacrifice to the Supreme Creator, as it all came from the same space anyways. This is to remind Arjuna that no object or experience is owned by an individual person. The result to the person offering the sacrifice of the body, mind, and intellect is promised the union with the Supreme Being at the end of life. Krishna reminds Arjuna that the ability to think is what differentiates humans from other conscious beings. A practice is developed when one disciplines the mind in a particular way. Whatever area a person chooses to excel in is due to a disciplined mind focused in this area. The way that a doctor can notice and talk about health concerns in almost all situations. Krishna is encouraging Arjuna to have such a disciplined mind about spiritual union and the truths of human existence. And when the mind wanders to bring it back again and again to this focused awareness. From such a training, the mind will effortlessly come back to this space. This creates a practiced flow of thought in the same direction again and again. From such a practice, a person of perfection becomes the nature of brilliance and is illumined from within by a power from within. This is why images of many saints, sages, and higher consciousness itself are often depicted with light around them or a halo above the image or the idea. Arjuna is being told that such a person joins higher consciousness that works through all of the expressions of the combined collective subtle energies. This is the being of higher consciousness. This is the totality becoming the one. So an individual may merge with the totality of one, which is the goal of each soul's own personal subtle consciousness. This understanding through the Gita is an attempt from Vyasa, the narrator of the conversation shared between Krishna and Arjuna, which combines the philosophical and abstract ideas from the Upanishads into a more simplistic understanding for the common man through the Gita. Different religions describe God in different ways. The consistencies include that God is unimaginable, not subject to birth or death, not limited to a specified location, and not an object with observable qualities or limitations. Once one tries to define the undefinable, the idea is not quite right, as it is unimaginable. He is also described as beyond past, present, and future, not bound by time, change, or creation and destruction, or beginning and end. People understand that a creator has to be present before the creation. Even when the creation is destroyed, the creator remains. This energy means that it is ancient, yet it is also as new today as it was then. It is also a supreme energy that is beyond all darkness. The three ingredients necessary to stay steady with the union with higher consciousness are discrimination, devotion, and discipline. Arjuna has already learned how to focus through right action, through meditation, and then through knowledge and gaining wisdom. In this chapter, Krishna describes the infinite nature of higher consciousness and now also describes the sound of Om as the sacred sound of Brahman. Om has an unknown value and is immeasurable. Only when the mind is free from the distractions of personal desires is it able to think about the abstract nature of unity through Om. Arjuna learns that it is the sound and specifically the utterance of this sound that is important. Remember that the original teaching of Vedic scripture was not written. It was spoken and heard. Krishna mentions how very important this utterance is to invoke higher consciousness. Krishna mentions that a yogi disciplines the mind to block or control the nine gates. 
The nine gates are the eyes, nostrils, ears, mouth, anus, and reproductive organs. This practice allows the mind to become very powerful. Directing the mind's energy to the heart is also very useful at this time. In this chapter, Arjuna has specifically asked about the time of death for an individual and how this is to be experienced. Krishna shares the specific direction given to yogis to keep an unwavering mind by bringing their attention back to focused breathing and or through contemplation on God or the higher self with devotion, love and adoration. Krishna speaks of the enormous energy that is part of each person which consists of the subtle higher conscious energy. He teaches Arjuna that all nine gates can be consciously closed by a yogi who draws his attention to the heart space which is the core of the self and the higher self. This is linked with where the focus of the mind, thoughts, feelings and emotions lie. Often linked with the I am statements or mantras, that help people unite with higher consciousness. From the heart space, the energy spreads to all other parts of the self and to all others too. The seat of consciousness is understood by many, interpreting the scriptures as stemming from the heart space. From here, man can focus with an intention to bring this energy up to the top of the head to be prepared to exit at the time of death. Krishna is teaching Arjuna to combine yoga, which is union with the divine, which may include controlled breathing, bhakti, which is devotion or love for higher consciousness, and dhyana, profound meditation. The expectation is that there is a correct knowledge and love for the goal to be reached. Om is encouraged to be uttered with reverence for what it represents at the end of life as well. A saint does not look at an objective reality, but a space that is within himself as one and the same as his higher consciousness. He experiences each experience as himself. To remember the wisdom of these details at the time of departure is man correctly placing himself at the seat of consciousness for connection or merging with the divine. This connection is described as a movement within the heart. The person's mind is engaged in remembering the higher consciousness or Lord. The intelligence is engaged in focusing on the consciousness. The body is engaged in uttering Om. And Prana through conscious breath work is engaged through focusing it at the highest point at the top of the head. Krishna explains that when such a person leaves as the soul that he is, He goes to the highest designation as he has purified the entire individual personality. The mind is purified by devotion. Ignorance or intelligence is purified with knowledge or wisdom. Prana is purified by disciplining its direction. And upasana, attending to through reverence, is achieved through the utterance of om. This is the way to leave the body consciously. Important to note that this experience cannot happen unless such purification processes have been practiced before the time of actual death. This is what a yogi practices regularly to unite with higher consciousness. This consistent practice makes it easy to reach this goal in uncertain times or at the time of death, and likely both. Thoughts of higher consciousness are in such a mind always, in every time, and nothing else is given the same focus in all times. This method allows a human to live in freedom while living life itself, not waiting until death or a rebirth either. This is living fully present. A yogi strives to reach the original starting point of creation. Such a person is not waiting for another experience or existence that is striving for a rebirth to enjoy any desires. Other seekers are also doing good work with steady minds who wish to enjoy successes and desires in this world or the next through fulfillment of the desires sought. Krishna makes it clear that both of these paths are possible for a true seeker. The action and the intention of a seeker's good work are both important. The same good work can be done for fame, money, a creation, or any other success. 
the same good work can be done for the purpose of union with the divine with complete satisfaction with that union itself. Whatever the intention, such will be the results experienced. Chapter 8 for the Healthcare Guru. This is a great chapter for those in healthcare to use to remind ourselves about our own thoughts, concerns, fears, and expectations around life and death. For anyone who has seen or worked with the loss of a patient, or even with chronic illness in patients, family, or friends, we may have already experienced the end of a life. Yet not many really think about this for too long. Even for those working in palliative care, the energy may be spent in extending the quantity and or quality of life for the dying, yet a real understanding of our own end of life may be filled with fear and uncertainty. This chapter is very clearly from the perspective of a spiritual tradition that believes in reincarnation. Yet remember that Krishna, who is the friend of all, is representing really each person's own soul. As already mentioned, that any person can use this awareness expressed from his or own spiritual tradition or tr religion. And remember that each day is also expressed as an analogy to a full life experience from waking to sleeping and being reborn into waking again. Each person does have this experience every day. So how does a healthcare guru value his or her own day or life experience? Many are living repeated experiences daily, as discussed in the last chapter. Unless one is clearly aware of the goal one is trying to reach, this repetitive pattern can continue, filled with anxiety, frustration, anger, and the pursuit of various desires. If one who is working with healthcare daily can create time for themselves to truly understand and value each moment as they pour focus into the three key ingredients discussed in this chapter, namely discrimination, devotion, and discipline, a much higher, literally, experience can be lived every single day. So one's mind can discriminate between the details that are valuable to put attention into and the things to let go. One can be devoted to the healthcare work that they can pour their hearts into, and one can discipline the self to let go of worries and concerns that are beyond our control. Whether we are helping patients or clients through chronic illness or even acute conditions, a practitioner can realize that any interaction may be the last. Many people do die suddenly without any warning, and some we may not expect to lose even with plenty of signs pointing to this time. Unless a practitioner has some awareness and understanding of their own feelings towards death and dying, they will likely be overwhelmed with such an experience. And remember that healthcare practitioners can and do experience losses in their personal relationships, family health, and loss in colleagues too. Many losses or deaths are experienced by every single person. This chapter is a good time to assess our own thoughts about death. How comfortable are we in speaking about this with our friends, family, and patients? Many times patients are not comfortable in speaking about this too. Can we make them more comfortable in sharing without the fear of making us uncomfortable, as they may discover from our reactions? Different cultures have different rituals that they may plan for at funerals. Is a health professional comfortable in asking about the process or planning beyond a living will or estate planning suggestions? If one is not comfortable with such discussions, do you have people to refer clients to in order to help them through such important considerations? Remember that this book is truly focused on self-development and mastery. This is the best chapter to remind ourselves about this inevitable time for each of us. To understand our own thoughts about our own death and or of those close to us can help us truly appreciate each day that we are alive and able to share the best of ourselves with our loved ones and definitely with ourselves too. This goes beyond treating oneself to the occasional shopping spree, meal out or vacation. This is about truly loving life itself. 
being truly present to the hundreds of beautiful experiences every person can witness every day. Remember that this chapter also focuses on the idea that whatever is thought about most will be the next experience we wake up to, and we can look at this as waking up the next day or in our dying days. If we are consistently thinking about worries, we will attract more to worry about each day. And if we are consistently looking on the bright spot of every situation, we will see many bright spots everywhere, even at the time of our own death. So take some time to understand how comfortable you are in speaking about death with those around you. Do you become tense or fearful? Or do you accept this as part of life that can be spoken about openly and honestly, even though many emotions may arise? The more we can become comfortable in understanding and accepting such a time, the more ease we will bring to our own minds, and that ease will be felt by patients too. Another key area for healthcare professionals to acknowledge here is that many patients come to us for care to live longer. When a person feels their healthcare provider is not helping them do this, they may react by blaming us for not helping more or differently. When we know that we are doing the best we can through our abilities, we can have ease in our own minds even with such accusations. This is a time that having faith in one's intentions and actions in the work is most useful. Even more useful is knowing that a higher consciousness is guiding our own work too when we are working from pure intention in our care and our service. Being blamed when we may be grieving for a patient's suffering is not easy for healthcare practitioners since we are often concerned if we can help more even in the best of times. Most people working with healthcare know that they too need support through such times, yet many people do not take the time to consistently work with supports. Healthcare professionals especially may feel they should know how to get over such experiences or how to deal with loss because patients come to them when they need healing. So who helps the healthcare professional when healing? And do they take the time to acknowledge their own possible discomfort or inability to handle death and dying? This is a chapter to remind each healthcare practitioner to do this. We all need to learn this not only for the patients or clients we work with, but also for our friends, family, and ourselves. It's worth the effort for us to do this for the good for all that will be touched by us mentally, emotionally, and or physically. This is the energy we are carrying to those that we care for.